both products are somewhere along this line, right? They're going to buy whichever product is closer to them, basically. So technically, this is not a monopoly, it's competition, but you'll see the logic is exactly the, the Spence logic. So imagine each firm starts somewhere along the line, um, and you know, a natural question is, starting somewhere along the line, where is the firm going to move? Anthony, where, where, imagine the firms are two places along some line, consumers live along the line, where is the firm going to move? They're going to move towards the other firm. Why? Because like, if there's a middle, and you always want to get more of the middle. They would like if they're just going to go towards the. You, you cater to the marginal consumers, right? And the marginal consumers are the ones that are halfway between you guys. Um, exactly. Um, and that is the one who is halfway in between you guys. That's the one who's marginal, so you move towards your competitor. And this holds at every point. No matter where these guys are, they're always going to want to move towards the other one. So they've got to wind up at the same point, right? Um, and this spot has to be in the exact middle. Why? Because if it wasn't in the exact middle, imagine it was a bit to the right of the middle. Well, I could just move slightly to the left of that guy, get all of the consumers to the left, and leave him only with the guys to the right. So the equilibrium has to be that everyone is right at the middle. Or more precisely, if they weren't uniformly distributed uh, at the median of the distribution. And so this leads to a very simple extreme prediction, uh, which is called Hotelling's Law. So just to give you a graphical depiction of this, here's the Hotelling line. Imagine it's a beach, right? Uh, the beach has some length. People are sitting in different spots along the beach. And these are like lemonade stands, and they're figuring out where to locate. And they're all going to be driven to the center of the beach. Um, so in this simple model, both firms end up exactly at the middle of the beach, right? This is one of the most famous results in economics. Um, and it's inefficient. Because clearly everyone would be better off if the firms were at 0.25 and 0.75, right? Because it's crazy to have these two things sitting at the same point in the beach. Everyone would be better if things catered a bit more to their preferences. But no firm wants to do this on their own. Uh, and therefore, it might be better to have a monopoly who would locate these things at the two places. So this is very widely applied, and it's quite relevant when you're literally thinking about geographic situations, but it doesn't necessarily lead to the right conclusion, which is that things are too similar in, in all situations. So imagine that there are some consumers who rather than, you know, who wouldn't necessarily buy one of the two products. Well, then some of the marginal consumers might not be just at the middle of the beach or in between the two guys. They might be in all different sorts of positions in the beach, right? And you're going to cater to your marginal consumers, not necessarily to the one who's just in between you and the other uh, uh, lemonade seller. And then things wouldn't be um, quite so horizontal. And the key question becomes, um, are the switchers the people who are in just indifferent between buying from you and buying from your competitor? Or are the people who are thinking about buying from you or buying from no one more representative of the whole set of people who are buying from you than are the, um, yeah, which one of those groups is more representative of the average consumer? And there's many situations in which the people who are switching between you are likely to be more representative than are the people who are exiting. And in that case, competition is going to make things better. And this all depends on um, whether the choice that's being made by the, um, by the firms is like the main dimension that makes them different from one another. So the key reason that uh, you know, we got this very strong result, that the marginal guy is always the one in between, is that the main thing that made these two stands different from one another was their position along the beach. But imagine that you know they had their position along the beach that was fixed, but then they were figuring out how good lemonade to make, right? Then the quality of their lemonade wouldn't be the main dimension of differentiation, and the people who are just switching between them are people who love lemonade and who might value the quality much closer to the average person than is someone who's thinking about not buying lemonade at all or not. So a key factor in whether this is giving you, you know, sort of the right way to think about things or not 
is whether the, the choice being made by them is the main thing that makes them different from one another, or whether it's uh, just some other dimension. Edward, do you have a question? Um, I was just wondering, like, so, like, is this, like, do, do companies, like, use, like, product differentiation to take care of the people that are going to buy the lemonade anyway? Or do they just, like, ignore those people and just assume they're going to buy the product? Well, so this model is going to assume that they're just going to buy the product. But in reality, firms sometimes do offer, like, you know, different types of quality of products. So they could have like a really good lemonade. But here, you know, you've just got one batch of lemonade. And that, that's, that's all you've got. Um, so, um, if we have the opposite thing, we get the opposite result. So this hotel thing, I think, is a useful way to start thinking about these product design questions and a useful baseline. But it, the sort of base expense reasoning that you cater to the marginals and inframarginals and thinking which one of those, you know, which set of marginal consumers is more representative gives a much more general basis for considering this. Yeah, Andy. So, for example, um, the variance example of like how laundry soap companies focus on like um, taking customers out of uh, their competition would be focusing on switchers rather than exiters? Yes, so, exactly. Uh, and exiters are people who will, won't buy anything at all. Or won't buy any soap at all. Yeah. So you always have to think about those things. Okay, who are the people who switch to the other competitors, and who will uh, switch to buying nothing at all? And more competition makes more people willing to switch to your competitors. And then the key thing about whether that's good or bad for the quality of the product is whether those switchers are more representative of the total population of your consumers than are the exiters. Yeah, Ben. In theory, it seems like easy to like figure out like the marginal customer, but like how do you actually do that and how does a company do that in practice? Like is it consumer like surveys or something or like Yeah. Do they actually play with the prices? Yeah, I mean they play with the prices, they look at <laughs> consumer surveys, they look over time as the product starts to get more popular, who came in first, who comes in last. There's this whole notion of like early adopters versus like latecomers. And the early adopters are obviously the inframarginal people and those people tend to be like people with high educations, people in big cities, people who are sort of tech nerds, et cetera. So that's one thing that, and, and, and they do lots of marketing studies to try to figure this sort of thing out and figure out what the preferences of different types of consumers are. So that's what the whole field of marketing is about. In some sense, you can view this lecture as being about marketing. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really yeah. get what it means, like defensive, the dimension is the main one dimension. Okay, so like, um, the reason why in hoteling everyone clustered towards the center is the only thing that made these two lemonade stands different from one another was where they were on the beach, and that's what they were choosing, where to be on the beach. But imagine they were at a fixed location on the beach, and that was the main thing that made them different from one another. But now they're going to decide how sweet to make their lemonade, right? Now the question is, does the like person who's sitting at the middle of the beach and thinking about switching between these two guys like sugar in their lemonade more or less uh, than the people who are sitting all along the beach you know, on my half, but are thinking about getting lemonade or not getting lemonade. You see what I mean? And is that preference more representative of the whole population of people who are going to buy lemonade from me? Right? Yeah. Yeah, wait. So, exiters are more representative. Are you saying that a poor selling salon does not? In fact, it can often be reversed. Okay. You can get exactly the opposite. And I'm going to give an example in a moment that will appeal to you intuitively of exactly when that can that, that can happen. Okay, so the median voter theorem um, is, so the most common application of hotelling's logic is to think about political competition. So imagine that there are two political parties uh, that are, you know, from left to right and they're competing for consumers. Everyone votes and it's just a question of whom they're going to vote for, right? Um, and, uh, Oh, Federico left. Please will be back soon. Uh, let me just switch them. V Victor. Uh, Leo. Um, what, what, you know, in this model, what would hotelling's law say? So, like, in accordance with the beach thing, both of them just <coughs> in the middle of the center. Yeah, so both of them are just going to run to the center, right? Um, and... So the median voter theorem says both political parties will adopt a position of the median voter who has an equal number of voters to her left or her right. right? And this is 
probably the most fundamental result in all of political science. Uh, he also is just common sense and what people think. You know, during general elections, parties run to the center, right? They try to capture the center ground. Um, especially in a two-party winner-take-all system, right? Um, and a subsidiary <coughs> thing of that is that in years where the election is more competitive, there's gonna, people are going to adopt more centrist positions. If the candidates are bad, you might cater, you might do whatever you want, you're not going to be constrained. People run more to the center as, yeah, but... Does this account for, like, the primaries and people running to the right or the left? In the well, primary? I'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> um, so one dominant party may be able to favor its own view uh, more if it doesn't have a strong challenger, but if it has a strong challenger, it's forced to run towards the center, right? But this is a very simplified model, and there's a more general principle behind it coming out of Spence. So, um, Federico, what things are missing from the median voter model, which I will describe again to you if you're out of the room? So the median voter model is that there are two political parties. Everyone has to vote. The political parties are on the left and the right, and you know, people are on the left and the right. And it's just a question of who people are going to vote for. So what about real-world voting does this model miss? Don't, don't just look up this. No, no, I'm just trying to look at what we need. Um, so the model is assuming that everyone's going to vote. It's just a question of which party they're going to vote for. And the parties are just arrayed on left to right spectrum, right? Well, those two things are really different. I don't think that's what you're asking. Yeah, yeah. So in what, what senses do you think? Yeah. So there are people who don't vote, and, and what else? The, they can differentiate, the, the candidates can differentiate themselves. Yeah, exactly. So like, what, what would you give an example of like two different dimensions on which the political parties differentiate themselves? Um, so like taxes and uh, like issues like abortion. Exactly. So social versus economic issues, right? Yeah, Victor. Well, <clears throat> they don't have to worry about, like, uh, you know, they, if they go too hard in the middle, then their core will, like, pull a tea party or something like that. Yeah, ex exactly. So that's what, that's what I was about to say. So, okay. So w the first problem is that voters are just in one dimension, <coughs> right? Uh, and that is not usually the case, and not everybody votes. And so Spence's logic shows us exactly how we can extend this analysis, rather than this median voter thing, which seems kind of unrealistic, it's kind of cute, but unrealistic, to think about the real world. So uh, what really matters is not the median voter. It's the swing <coughs> voter, right? And this is what any politician says, right? We always try to cater to various different groups of swing voters. Not all the groups of swing voters are exactly the same. They're not all just the median voter, right? Because there are just different groups. So there's a famous divide between so-called central, se sensible centrists and radical middle. So sensible centrists tend to be people like you guys, sort of like up, you know, upper middle class educated people, and they uh, tend to be economically conservative and socially liberal, right? Uh, on the other hand, there's radical middle people who tend to be blue collar workers uh, who are not very well educated in rural areas, and they tend to be economically cons uh, economically liberal but socially conservative. Um, and those are just clearly, I mean, there's no median voter. It's just very different views. You know, if, if social is along one dimension and economics along the other dimension and the parties are here, then there's like a whole group of people along the diagonal who, who are indifferent between them. And so different types of policies target different groups. Some things that attract the sensible centrists will alienate the radical middle and vice versa, as these people totally disagree with one another. So the core of political strategy is how to target different groups of swing voters, not just to how to run to the median voter, right? That gives you, I think, a much richer understanding of what political strategy is about than just the median voter theory does. Um, and um, let's
maybe trying to tie 